it's great that you uh, that I see all of you again in physical <laughs> person meet up here at uh, the Berlin Buzzwords again. So um, the talk today is as introduced again about memory map directory. We had a similar talk last year in the conference. So people who attended the conference last year will see some familiar slides. So the first half of the talk is more or less the same like last year and the second part is then about Java 19 and what's coming um, after that. So my background is um, I'm one of the very, very early Lusine and Zola committers. I think Adrian had his 10 years, uh, but I think for me it's now 14 years and I'm working um, mostly on the Lucene core. Um, I'm also working on Zola and sometimes also on Elasticsearch. And actually I'm working at the University of Bremen and I invented the original numeric search in Apache Lucene and that was when I came uh, to Lucene in 2008, I think. So, and I'm also doing consulting if anybody needs help, yeah. <laughs> So, and the first thing about memory mapping, um, so what has memory mapping to do with Lucene and um, why, uh, why, why do we want to use it for accessing our index? Because some people say, yeah, no, don't use memory mapping. Other people say, yes, this works better, uh, much better. And I'm also on their side. It works, works much better uh, because Lucene is not something like a relational database. Uh, that's something where the, the Lucene index and the inverted index works perfectly well with that. So the first thing is something like a background. Um, I call it the 70s style of file reads. Uh, that's going back to some really, really old Unix versions. So the idea, if you have an index file on disk and you sometimes need to read, uh, you need to read some bytes from it uh, to, to execute your search, uh, the problem is uh, how, how do you want to do that if you have a very, very large index? You cannot simply load it completely into memory. Um, also makes no sense for large databases. So you need some I.O. layers on the operating system. And in the early days, uh, and still today, 90% of all C applications are working like that um, in, in the code is. So you, you just have, have a file pointer, and then you seek inside the file to a specific person. That's a, a position, and this uh, is called the seek. And then in the second step, you're reading uh, some files from disk into some local buffer of your application. In Java, it would be on the heap, a byte array, or whatever, and then you are working with that, uh, with that data. So uh, the problems with that is, the first is you have to allocate some local buffer in your program because you first need to copy that stuff from the disk to the local buffer. And actually for that uh, thing, you also need two syscalls uh, to the operating system kernel. The first is a seek. And the second one is um, uh, the actual read from the file because you're first positioning the file pointer and then reading uh, a few bytes from it. And then this data is copied to your local buffer. Um, but there's also something behind the screen, uh, scenes, uh, uh, scenes, which is uh, the kernel, for example, tries to help you a little bit with the file system um, cache. So there's this nice... Um, uh, diagram how, how the file system cache works. So when, when you are first accessing specific bytes uh, of a file, uh, the, uh, uh, this second syscall to read those bytes is uh, just asking the file system cache, is this already available there? And if yes, it will not go to disk and read it. But again, it will copy the data from the file system cache to your, uh, to your local uh, program buffer where the data will be copied to. That's the one thing. And if, if, uh, if, if you're reading a lot of other stuff at some point, uh, it will figure out that this data can go away. It will be uh, removed from the file system cache and then at a later stage, it will read the stuff again from disk. So that's basically what the file system cache is doing in very, very simple picture. And um, 
the other problem that we have is we have to copy the data from the file system cache with it, which is external to your program uh, to inside the user space where your program is running. So there's the additional context switches that needs to be done during that syscall. So that's the reason why reading a lot of data like this is not a good idea in most cases. You can, of course, reduce the whole cost by using large buffers, so you can read a lot of bulk at, at once, but it doesn't really help if you want to do random access on the file. So that's uh, the problems. And uh, on top of that, um, if you're looking at Java programs, it really gets worse behind that because the application is running on the heap space and because the garbage collector needs to be uh, needs to have the uh, possibility to move the byte arrays on the heap to any place while garbage collecting, collecting, there's an additional copy in it. So actually, the kernel copies it to some internal buffer. It's called a direct buffer somewhere in the I.O. layer of Java. And then, uh, the, uh, then this data is copied by Java code. So it's under control of the garbage collector to, to your uh, heap, sp uh, heap space in Java. So you actually you have two copies of the data, which makes it, again, uh, slower. And uh, the original implementation of that is simple FS directory in Apache Lucene. Uh, that was deprecated and already removed in Java uh, in Lucene version 9, uh, because there's a, uh, a second thing, but the first thing is, uh, what I wanted to tell you about is, there's another problem with the whole seek and then read data is multi-threading, because um, you need to synchronize the whole access, because Lucene opens the file only once. It only has one file pointer, and the file pointer has a position in the file. So when you have multiple threads reading from that file, it first needs to seek somewhere and then read the stuff, which, is, which needs to be synchronized, because otherwise some thread could move the file pointer and, the, and another thread when reading the data, which it doesn't expect to use. So And because of that, it's internally synchronized, so this is not a good idea. It was used for because of some bugs with Windows in the earlier times. But nowadays, uh, most code is using the 90s style of uh, file reads, which is the two calls to the operating system are moved to one call. So you can do uh, a random read from some random position uh, into a buffer. Uh, so you, you don't need the synchronization in that. And uh, actually, you only have one syscall, so it gets cheaper. So... Um, the Lucene implementation of that is NIOFS directory. It's still available and you can still use it. For some use cases, it's well to use it because there are some problems with the approach I'm showing afterwards. Um, there's also something, it prevents a duplicate copy inside uh, the Java heap in most cases because um, Java code can directly access that direct buffer, so the NeoFS directory does not copy it multiple times for, for most cases. And um, so it's quite okay for, for, for some use cases, but in general that's not the default uh, of... Um, of, uh, of, of Lucene anymore since I think version 3.2, uh, the changes to the new one which I'm showing now. And uh, the problem here is although with that one it's broken on Windows because Windows uh, and Java does not like each other with the positional reads. They still do seek and uh, all that stuff, so it really gets slow. So on Windows, never ever use an IOFS directory or the old one. So there's the only solution currently to use a memory map directory on Windows uh, with Java. So the questions that you might all of you might th uh, think of is why do we copy that data at all? Why do we need to copy it from the Linux kernel to the to the uh, local buffer of your uh, of your uh, of your application? Why do we need to copy the data into the heap space of Java? Why do we need to ask the kernel on every request to load that data for us? We are not interested in that. We just want to see the whole index as one homogeneous. Uh, 
uh, way of accessing it. So something like we want to like uh, want to see it like memory as a whole bunch of memory. It could be several terabytes. So that's uh, how we want to see it, and we want to leave it to the operating system kernel to decide uh, which data needs to be loaded and. That's what uh, what I call then the millennium way uh, of file reads. So we are preventing the copy of data between the buffers at all. No kernel, no user space, no Java heap. We have no syscalls at all. So only when Lucene opens the index, we have a syscall. So everything else is completely in memory somehow. And um, we make use, ideal use of the file system cache, and it's very simple code. If you would think of uh, simple, you don't need to take care of loading that data, decide which page I want to see. So it's, it's quite easy. You just have a large byte array of your whole index, and you go somewhere and read a byte from it, and the operating system decides for you, do I need something to read from this? So it's basically uh, your, your, um, your data is like in... Uh, like in a swap file, um, as you know, your swap partition, it's exactly the same mechanism behind that. And how does it work? So actually, uh, in, in modern operating systems and, and architectures of the operating system, uh, you have something like physical addresses which are really pointing to your RAM chips as somewhere uh, to a byte somewhere in your RAM chip uh, to figure out. But actually, when you are starting a program on your operating system, every program gets, gets somehow a few on the whole uh, air, uh, on the whole address space available that has its virtual view on, uh, on, on the hardware behind. And that virtual view can be anything. It can be your RAM chips, which are still there, but it can also be a file on disk, or, um, or it, it, uh, they, they are also in, in the physical memory. You have other processes in the operating system. Sometimes it's also possible that parts of that uh, address space your, operating, uh, your, your um, application sees is shared with another application. Could also be that's usually the case if you have dynamic libraries uh, or char files they are loaded in in some common space seen by all those processes so that's uh, basically what is behind and you might see the idea behind lucene is to use that bottom part here to have one of the address space seen by lucene uh, available for for that how does it work um, internally so you have here uh, the cpu um, on, the, on the left side, and it somehow decides that it needs to read some address, which is a completely virtualized address. And then inside the CPU, there's something which is called the trans translation looker side buffer, which is something like a high level cache. Uh, no, yeah, something like a cache which is always uh, jumping in when a virtual address needs to be translated to something which is in, in main memory. And actually what this is doing, if there's a hit, it can go to the main memory, read the bytes, and all is fine. So, but there might be the possibility, because this cache is quite small, it's not, not too large, uh, that there is a cache miss, so it doesn't know where that virtual address is actually uh, uh, available. And then the Linux kernel and also Windows kernel has something which is called the page table, which is quite huge for the whole address space. And there it can do the same look at like in the TLB. And then if there's a hit, it will go to the same memory address. So basically that's a way of caching. But the other case would be that the page table says, no, I don't have that in memory anywhere, so I cannot give you that information. In that case, um, there will be a page fault, and then there are several possibilities to handle that. Um, so, for, for example, um, if, it, if it figures out uh, that data is not available, it's an invalid address, it could be. So for example, if you have a null pointer or whatever, or you're going outside of your address space, then it will simply say, okay, no, this address is not there, and that's what you are seeing when you get a segmentation fault. That's a famous thing, um, I think. Uh, no, I don't have the picture, but, but you also see it sometimes in Java, then something went wrong, so you see a segmentation fault. And the other case, it could also be, no, this page, I want to access this virtual page is only available on secondary storage like your SSD or hard disk, and then it will load it. 
again. So basically, that's uh, the idea how it works. And normally, this was originally only used for swap files, but now it's done for uh, everything um, also like mapping index files into memory. So the advantages of that is uh, the Linux kernel uh, manages free space for you. Uh, so you don't need program logic, you don't need to take care how much uh, memory is still available, you just tell it, I want to access, access that virtual address and it does it for you. Uh, so, and if you, if you see at some point that your, uh, that your application is running slow and the disk I.O. goes up, you need to add more RAM, that's uh, a special thing, so you might know Simon Willner, he said it in a previous talk, I think in 2012 or something like that, you need to add more RAM to your, um, to your to a physical machine uh, to make it available. So how does it work with Lucene? Uh, Apache Lucene uses a memory mapping directory um, that's by default used for Solar and Elasticsearch and OpenSearch, of course. Um, it, so, so basically, there are two ways. When we are writing the index, we don't use memory map directory at all. The code for the index output is always the same. We are just writing a stream of data. When we build the index, we just write it to disk. There's nothing with memory map directory at all. We just save it in the conventional way. Uh, we don't care about that because uh, the indexing is not the highest priority on speed. And because the data is sequentially written to disk, there's nothing we need to take care of. Uh, we are only thinking about uh, not, uh, not, not putting everything into the file system cache, uh, which is not needed afterwards, but generally we just write it out. For the index input, uh, the Lucene implementation uses mapped byte buffers, and uh, for some reason they are chunked into one gigabyte sized chunks, and um, the index input allows for sequential access, but also random access losing long pointers. So why do we have the chunks of one gigabyte? This is something which goes back to Java 1.4, and that's also why I'm talking today, because that's what, what changes now in Lucene is. The problem is, uh, behind all of that is the Java class byte buffer, and the Java class byte buffer is 32 bits. Okay. By 32 bits and one gigabyte. Yeah, the problem here is in Java, everything is signed. That's the first problem. So two gigabytes. Okay. Yeah, I could make the chunks of two gigabytes. But actually, the problem here is we don't want to have the chunks somehow unaligned. Uh, so the problem is with uh, unsigned integers. Unfortunately, it is uh, 2 to the power of 31 minus 1. So we don't get exactly 2 gigabytes in it, we only get 2 gigabytes minus 1 into it. And because of that, the next lower uh, possible way uh, to handle that in Java is uh, 1 gigabyte. And that's the reason why the memory mapping is done in chunks of virtual address space of 1 gigabyte. And then internally, it's using some bit shifts and bit masks to convert the long pointers to the actual, to figure out which byte buffer it needs to access and then to which byte it needs to go inside. Uh, the code then for reading a byte from a position looks like that. It just do the calculation, as I said before, some bit shifts, and you see the end here on the on the right side, and it, it tries to do that on the on the byte buffer that it figures. Uh, so so it just says, I just read from there. I don't know if it's inside bounds or anything like that, because in most cases it will succeed, and if it does not succeed, um, it will catch the exceptions and then throw the correct ones in Java, like, for example, if it's already closed and all of that. So in most cases, only the yellow code is executed, and it's also optimized by the hotspot compiler. So actually, when you read a byte from a Lucene index, only the yellow two lines are uh, actually executed. Everything else is really, really seldom. But uh, because of the chunks of one gigabyte, there are also some really horrible program logic inside. For example, if you're at the end of one buffer, like two bytes before the end, and you try to read an int with the first one, like uh, the get int on the byte buffer, it can happen. 
yeah, that it doesn't work because you're at the end of the buffer. And in that case, the try-catch blocks really go into action. And then what it does here, if it figures out that there's a buffer underflow exception, it goes and then it uses it by, it reads it byte by byte with the code you have seen before. So that's actually, but it's really seldom because we have one gigabyte, uh, we, have, we have chunks of one gigabyte and the, the probability that you're reading an integer just at that uh, point is really, really low. Yeah, so it gets, so, so actually the code for reading the bytes is then a little bit more complex. So it also reads it from the byte buffer, so all easy. So uh, why is it used in Lucene? So the I.O. characters uh, of Lucene is, and that's also the slide, why, because a lot of people say memory mapping in databases does not work well. The reason why it works well is with Lucene is all the files in Lucene are write once, read many. So that means once a file is written to disk, we never change it anymore. So putting a memory mapping on top of it does not have any concurrency issues. We know the map file is still there and we know what's exactly inside. We can just leave it to the operating system to load the correct uh, places. And if you have multi-threaded access, it just duplicates the byte buffers. They are all pointing to the same virtual memory location and we read from there. So that's easy. And, uh, but, but there's a huge problem from the early days, uh, that is um, uh, the segmentation fault where you unmap uh, the data, uh, because there's no way, because you have the small byte buffer objects to load those into, um, into uh, to tell the system to, uh, to, to actually free them. And because it's only something like a few bytes, Latching, uh, pointing to something like a gigabyte of um, address space, there's, it's, it's very hard for the system to decide um, to, to actually garbage collect that stuff. And that's a problem, and because of that, uh, you some, uh, there is something like a hard-coded unmapping in Lucene which leads to a segmentation fault if you're closing the index like a thread is running at the same time. And the problem is we are working something uh, which is already now this year 20-year-old bug report in Java to have an unmap method on the map byte buffer to actually free the map byte buffer. We have to wait for the garbage collector and that's what, what I'm talking about now. The workaround is we have some code going in the internals of the JVM and uh, we need, just need to make sure that we don't access that memory after it is uh, finished. So how to use this? As I said before, you just use it on 64-bit platforms. Elasticsearch OpenSense use it by default. For most index files, Solar adapts the Lucene factory. So that's easy. If you have an index, it looks like that. So you see here in your top output, 30, uh, 73 gigabytes of virtual space and 8 gigabytes of your heap space. And if you uh, sum up uh, the story, uh, the disk space needed for those five indexes here, it's approximately oh, it 75 gigabytes. So you see here, don't be afraid, it can also be terabytes there for the virtual address space. That's fine. So for tuning is, uh, the most important thing is maximum use of 25% of physical RAM should be used for the heap space because uh, the heap space is allocated to Java. The file system has no chance to, uh, to really use it for the, for the paging. So if you're uh, installing Elasticsearch and uh, Luzine, use as low as possible heap space and let almost everything free of the, for the operating system to use uh, the, the caching. Um, and, and possibly only run uh, Luzine, Zola or Elasticsearch on the node and nothing else. Yeah, so now I'm coming to the fun stuff in Java 19, which is, um, which is Project Panama. Um, so um, improving and in, uh, so the idea of Project Panama, which tries to fix that issue that you have seen before with memory access, 32 bit pointers and all of that is Project Panama, which started, I think, in JDK 14, and it wants to bring the bridge to native code in Java, so it also makes it possible, for example, to call operating system functions in the C library or your OpenGL drivers or whatever, you can do that, but the actual part of that is Interesting for Lucene is uh, new classes. One is called the memory segment on top of a memory address and uh, var handles, which is new since Java 9, which is uh, for accessing uh, a memory in on-heap or off-heap. 
And the memory segment can cover any address space. It's 64 bit, so we don't need any chunking anymore. And it uses a positional API uh, using longs. So the history here is so it was starting in JDK 14 and then in 14 and 15. It was completely unusable for Luzine because there was something called in threat confinement because you know for the unmapping you need to make sure that nobody else is accessing that memory that you want to free to the operating system. But unfortunately they decided to say, okay, only the current threat can access the memory, which is totally useless for multi-threaded application like Luzine. And because of that, it was impossible. And since JDK 16, we can use it. There's a possibility of shared memory segments. And there's a close action available, which is called resource scope, um, which was then in Java 19 called memory session. Um, Andrew Haley finally found a solution for that 20-year-old um, bug. Um, for that 20-year-old 20, uh, 20 bug uh, to get that working. And so the state after JDK 16 is now no slowdown during access to shared memory segment because it's completely native. We only have a pointer. We can be sure the pointer is there. We don't have to check if it's still available because in early days we were thinking of you are using a bowler tile or something like that to figure out that not another uh, uh, threat is accessing that virtual memory we want to free. But now we can access it. And if we access something which is already closed, we get an illegal state exception in Java. So it works perfectly. And the backside of that is the downside is um, for mapping or closing, internally the virtual machine will stop all the threads to get in a consistent state and then it will unlock the memory segment. You have to keep that in mind and we need testing with Elasticsearch to figure out how it works. So in JDK 19, so that's the last slides now, um, in Java 19 for the first time we have everything in the an incubating module, it's part of the Java base module. We have memory segment and some classes, and we can enable it optionally for everybody by using an pre enable preview command line. When you're starting Zola, Elasticsearch, whatever, you just need to add that to the Java command line, and then um, there's a pull request uh, about that already. Um, so it's mostly unchanged code, uh, but it detects this preview mode, and then you can in that version optionally enable uh, the, uh, the new, new code with memory segment. So we, we just have to wait till after uh, the Java 19 release and then we can make a release of Lucene using that and we'll automatically use it from memory map directory uh, dynamically at runtime it will decide. So basically that's done using a multi-release char. So actually uh, looks like that, the insides of the char. We had that in Java 8 already. The interesting thing is that it will only work with JDK 19, not with 20, because of some tricks inside the Java class files. Don't want to go to the details here. And uh, the code is looking very, very similar. Like, see, we can, we can have here, you have, we have seen that before. Looks identical, more or less. We only have 64 bits, and there are four operating uh, modes. If you're using Java 11 or Java 17, it behaves as before, nothing. So looks like that if you open it with Luke. If you go with Java 19 and have not yet enabled the preview mode, then you will see a log message, also in Elasticsearch or Zola, telling you to make full use of memory map directory. It will, um, uh, you need to enable the preview, so actually, um, it asks for the opt-in, otherwise it will use the old code. And um, if you pass a new option, the chunk size will be raised from 1 to 16 gigabytes. And then it looks like that if you're starting your application. And why do we still need chunking? Yeah, the reason for that is because of address space fragmentation. You have 64 bits of address space. And if you're allocating one terabyte or in one go, then it's somehow not really working well at some point, also with 64 bits. Yeah, and if you're running with Java after 20, uh, it does not yet work. So actually in September, you will get a Lucene release that makes it available also with the version nine. So, and your turn is now. Um, 
once uh, uh, this is out at some point in a, in a release after September, I think, in Luzin, uh, I encourage everybody to start your Elasticsoft Open Search Solar Server using the Enable Preview, which is a JVM command line parameter, so it gets automatically enabled and then report back, because as I told before, there are these strange things like it stops all threads when, uh, when, when it's closing the files, so we have to figure out how this works in production when you are quickly opening and closing files in your index because it's going into something which is called safe mode um, in, in, the, in the operating system. So, and you should also test it with those monster environments. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Uwe. Uh, I still have 10 minutes, so I know. Brilliant. I still have 10 minutes, so now with the questions. So now uh, we have, uh, you have the chance to ask some questions. Yeah, we have around 10 minutes time. I yeah. have one later on uh, online a question. Yeah. I will uh, post it over there. But so, ah, that's cool, yeah. okay. So are there any one who wants to ask him? I'm coming. Yeah, hi. Um, my question is, uh, do we have already any experience if we have like bigger merge operations doing because then we need to redo the buffers, right? Uh, yeah, uh, so actually that's something which I didn't have in the talk. Uh, so there are other possibilities, as I said, at, 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 uh, at this part here. Um, the Project Panama, it's also uh, all those external uh, you, you can also access the C API uh, below that, so there are possibilities now to, for example, also when we are writing files, we can tell the system, for example, to not use uh, the file system cache, for example, to not, pu not pollute it with new pages which are not read afterwards, for example, so for the merging. And um, what we can also do is for stuff like the term dictionary, for example, I already have code available, for example, we can lock the term dictionary into memory so it does not get paged out, for example, that can be done using the I.O. context. So when, when it takes I.O. context and uh, a specific file type, we can lock some pages because we have a memory address behind the memory segment and we can pass that memory address directly to a function in the C code. So in the library or in the C code, so there's no wrapping needed. You can just get a, a memory, a memory, no, no, memory a method handle uh, to access something like um, lock that pages. So that's one possibility. So there are improvements possible, but at the moment the memory mapping is still uh, like it was all the time. You have to live with uh, s some of the problems occurring during merges. Uh, so, and, oh, anyone else? Everyone satisfied? That's cool. So I will uh, check the online question for you. Yeah. Yep. But I still have some other question while he's looking for. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you, you. How responsive have the JDK team been to the feedback? Yeah. Now the, the political question. Yes, that was really, really good feedback. So uh, um, actually, yeah, as I said, in early versions, it was not working at all for Lucene because of misdesign like thread confinement. So you cannot use it in a multi-threaded way. So actually, every year there's this famous conference called FOSDEM in Brussels. And all the JDK people, including Mark Reinhold, are there. And always we have some beers at the time. And there was always a funny funny joke uh, to get, get them all drunk to agree that we need the unmapping in, in Java and at that point. So yeah, 
so it's it's re it's really nice. So we we uh, we are talking together, and a lot of improvements were also reported by our side, like slowdowns. So for example, where there were problems because in UAPI a memory segment is an immutable object, so it creates new ones if you create slices out of it. So something like a copy operation was really horrible for the garbage collector, and that's now fixed. So speed is as before, and yeah. So feedback loop is still ongoing, and we hope now that the preview API, there will be another preview API for, I think, Java 20, and then in 21, it will be by default enabled for everybody. So you have to wait one more year, and that's then the next long-term long -term release version, so it's, uh, yeah. But actually, it, you can use it also with, uh, with, with uh, the current Lucene 9 because it's a multi-release char, so it's compiled against Java 11, but at some point uh, you, you will get that multi-release char. So it, it will work out of the box with modern, new, new, new modern shady case. I think, uh, what is Elasticsearch using as default now? Yeah, which version? Ah, 18, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, so so you will be, also when 19 comes out, you will also use it, okay, yeah, so, and then you can do the testing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's another question. Uh, yes, we did uh, the benchmarking, so as I said, we had to report some bugs back, so actually I'm regularly running the loose like McCandles, um, Test suite, you have to, uh, to, to figure out that it's not getting slower and it lo all looks fine um, for, from, from that side. So except those memory issues with garbage collecting of uh, all those things. Uh, it's also some problems with benchmark suite. It has some suboptimal uh, command line because Mike McCandles wanted to switch off everything like tiered compilation. And for that new code, you need to have tiered compilation enabled. Otherwise, it will kill you. So please stay with standard uh, JDK options and not try to tune it in the wrong way. So Uwe, yeah. here we go. Ah, there. <laughs> You mentioned that after writing the index, we don't need to t uh, care about the reads, and then we copy the data if we are, uh, are multi-threading reads. But how does it work if we update a document and have many copies? Um, I don't fully understand the question. Um, Yeah, okay, so, um, so I, I don't fully understand the question, uh, but, uh, but, but with the multiple copies. So, so uh, actually, it depends what, what hot pages you have in the memory. So, for example, deleted documents, uh, so the multiple copies are then no longer used and uh, are not memory mapped anymore. Yeah, you said uh, to use 25 for physical memory. Is this number some relation with the size of index, number of segments inside server, some tips to calculate the site, uh, this value? Yeah, so I would start with 25 uh, percent, uh, which is fine. I think Elasticsearch has similar 30 percent or 40, I don't know. It, it, it depends, but the problem is really uh, there are some limits. So for example, never ever make uh, the heap space larger than 31 gigabytes because then you waste a lot of heap space. Uh, so 25 percent, in that case, it would be if you have a mach machine with more than 128 gigabytes of RAM, then it makes no sense uh, to go beyond the 25%. So actually, what you should do is, you should start your application, put normal load on it, lower the heap space as much as possible until you get the first out of memory exception, and then put 25% on top or something like that. That's, uh, that would be my rule how to tune it, but you cannot really pre-calculate it because it depends on if you're doing aggregations, if you have many indexes in your cluster that consume a lot of heap space for the management data structure, so your cluster state needs to fit into heap space. But with a simple Lucene application, not using Solar or Elasticsearch, you can run a huge query of a 200 uh, gigabyte index with uh, two gigabytes of heap space. Easily possible, doesn't, uh, it's, it's no problem at all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, when you close the index or files part of the index. So actually, um, I'm not yet fully sure how it behaves with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Zola or Elasticsearch uh, because you have to do some tests with large indexes where you have a high refresh rate and all that stuff. So actually it's not as bad because safe, uh, safe points in the JDK are done quite often, not only when, when we are stopping that. It's, it's happening on, on all races. So for example, if a de-optimization or something like that, it's just forceful at that point. So uh, I would not see too much problems uh, with that, but it needs uh, to have some testing. But actually, because uh, we, we could think of, you have something which is called this resource scope or mem memory session, so you can bundle everything together and then you can, for example, also do in one turn close all the index files, for example. Currently, it's per index file, but then if you would close the whole index, you can could theoretically do that. But that's a problem where we need to refactor Lucene internally when we open and close uh, those memory segments. Yeah. So. Yeah. Currently, it's not really possible because uh, the the code doesn't know it. But uh, yeah.